Welcome in, everybody. Today, we are studying Jesus' own words about the end times, what he prophesied would happen in Matthew 24 and 25. So if you're curious about end time stuff, we've been studying the whole book of Matthew. This is part of it. Let's pray. Father, we just ask you for divine wisdom. Help us to understand the scriptures. Help us to be open-hearted to what you have to say. Help us to take your word. Help us to apply it to our lives. We love you, Jesus. We thank you, God, that you're good and you're faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, welcome in, guys. We're in Matthew 24. Grab your Bibles. We're in verse 1. This is uh, really close to when Jesus is about to go to the cross, um, and he gives us this <laughs> pretty heavy teaching. Uh, that, that's all of Matthew 24 and 25. Verse 20, uh, verse, chapter 24, verse 1 says, Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. So quick comment on the temple. This was originally built by David, expanded a little bit by Solomon, expanded even more by Herod. That was the predecessor. That was the same Herod who tried to kill Jesus. Uh, verse 2, but he answered them, you see all these, do you not? And there's just like, you know, columnades, this row after row of these massive marble columns, huge, huge structure. You see all these, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So it, right on verse 2, he's prophesying what's going to happen in the Roman, uh, the Roman emperor Nero comes in and completely levels Jerusalem in 70 AD. That's going to happen in about, you know, uh, roughly 40 years after this time. If you're just tuning in, we're in Matthew 24. Get your Bibles. We're going to talk about end time. This is Jesus' own words on end times. Um, and I got a poll going in, in the comment section. What do you believe? There's, there's really three main theories. There's, um, and this isn't going to be an exhaustive study on the th different theories of, of end times. There's pre-tribulation pre rapture. That's kind of like when you, if you've seen the Left Behind movies where people are going to, you know, all of a sudden vanish off the earth. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. There's post-tribulation rapture. That's... Uh, uh, that the idea that Christians are going to live through all of this stuff that we're going to read about. And then there's also a third main theory. There's others, but a third main theory saying that we are already in the millennial kingdom that Revelation describes after Jesus' return, um, a thousand-year reign. And so you're going to have to stick around to find out my own personal beliefs. It's not the little beliefs of little big things, but it's my personal beliefs on it. So let's study the scriptures first, then we'll talk about that more. Verse 3, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, okay, intimate private conversation with his own disciples, saying, tell us, when will these things be? Again, they're referencing when the temple is going to be destroyed. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? They're already getting their theology correct in that uh, Jesus is saying, I'm coming again. Like, so, so they're, they're asking questions right near the end. Um, and quick comment, you may think, you know, why are we talking about this? Who cares? I want to posit to you something that a Bible teacher, a uh, Bible professor taught me years ago. Your cosmology, where we came from, and your eschatology, where we're going, Determine how you live your life here and now. What you believe is going to happen at the end of the world, how you believe the world came, that, that really dictates what do we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Amen? Verse 4, Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. So right off the bat, he's saying, You've got to stay attached to me. Don't, don't go off into the weeds here. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And I think the internet and YouTube does a really good job of leading people astray. So let's just stick with what Jesus said and not go on a, a tangent. Amen? Verse 6, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. So we've seen, uh, since this prophecy, we've seen multiple world wars. We saw the fall of the Roman Empire. We saw um, all sorts of crazies. We have, we have wars going on in our world right now as of 20, you know, 
April of 2024, we got a war in Israel and Gaza. We got a war in Ukraine, other threats throughout the world. There's uh, other issues going on as well. Hi, Nora. I guess say hi to the live chat people. Let me know. Let me know where you're watching from. Uh, but he's saying, see that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. Take heart. God already sees the whole timeline. You don't have to have it all be all stressed out and freaked out and worry about this and worry about that. You need to just live day by day in the moment, letting your heavenly Father lead you. Matthew 6, we already studied it. Go back and watch it if you need to. But he talked about anxiety. He said, do not be anxious. Today has enough of its own troubles. Let tomorrow worry about itself. Focus on today. Hey, Jared. Jared's from Kansas City. We got Andre. Um, Yeah, Andre, yeah. We don't, don't Don't go on the... If it seems too good to be true, like there's been a lot of people that said, Jesus is coming in 2000, blah, blah, blah. 2012 was a big year. And the, the, all these days come. Like God will, there's certain signs that you need to pay attention to. If you see these things happen, you know something, something's about to go down. Jesus said it himself. Hi, Dira. Watching from Johannesburg, South Africa. It's awesome. All right, let's keep studying here. We are in... Um, verse 7 of Matthew 24, For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. So all this shaking, birth pains is what other, other places in the scriptures say. Okay, or right here, excuse me. Verse 8, and all these are but the beginning of the birth pains. So my wife is about to have a baby. I mean, I'm sure many of you ladies who have had babies, you understand this, like, your body has the uh, uh, Braxton Hicks le- warm-up labor. This is like, this is getting ready for the real deal. This isn't it, but it's war- the, the wars, the famines, the earthquakes, the stuff that we're currently seeing in our world is progressing towards that uh, second coming. But there's, there's a few things, that are key things that you have to pay attention to before Christ comes. They're, they're, he's going to point out some really big ones here. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. So he's talking about global persecution. There's pockets of persecution right now. We don't have global persecution, but he's saying it's coming. Verse 10, and then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. We're starting to see more and more of that, this you know, especially in the political world, all this tribalism, people equate um, uh, this party with loving God and being Christian, this party anti-God, when in reality, <laughs> if you put any political leader above Jesus' lordship, you're in dangerous waters. So um, we need to stay close to the vine, as, uh, as he said in uh, the book of John. Verse 11, many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. It's interesting. He wrote this. This was written, you know, a couple thousand years ago. They didn't have the internet. You can now have one influencer who proclaims something and has a following of millions, and all of a sudden, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people are listening to this person and giving them credence. Just imagine that, that kind of false prophet power. Verse 12, and because lawlessness will be increased, not decreased, increased, the love of many will grow cold. So when, when the, the rubber hits the road, is your love genuine? What kind of soil do you have? That's what Jesus talked a lot about in Matthew 7. If we have good soil, or the, the uh, sorry, it's not Matthew 7, it's the parable of the sower. So if we have good soil, we're going to produce good fruit. But if we have shallow soil or rocky soil, um, we're going to burn out. We're not going to last. That's what he's talking about. Verse 13, but the one who endures to the end. If you have your Bible, if you have your Bible app, I want you to underline that. To the end will be saved. It's not following your life, following God for a little bit of your life, and at the end, well, it's getting a little too hard, a little too unpopular to be a Christian. Will we personally see the end times, the coming of Christ? Uh, we'll get to that towards the end. I'll, I'll let you know what I, what I personally believe. So stick with me. 
verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So again, he's talking about birth pains, the lead up to the finality, to the stuff we see in the book of Revelation, the stuff we see in the book of Daniel. A quick comment on to all nations. So I went to a missions college and uh, here in Minnesota, and our president went to this conference called the Lausanne Conference. It's all these missions leaders from around the world. And they had this moment, this is 2010 I'm talking about, where all these missions leaders are saying, here are the number of unreached people groups that we know of on the planet. I think it was 8,500. And each organizational leader stood up and said, we're going to commit to reaching these many organizations, this many organizations. So that prophecy that the proclaiming of the gospel to the whole world, to all nations, all people groups, is underway right now. These are the places that's the hardest. If you know what the 1040 window is, between the 10th parallel and the 40th parallel, uh, a lot of these countries are openly hostile to gospel. This is like the hardest places to reach people for Christ. But there's brave men and women that are doing it right now. So praise God. Uh, we... I, I'm excited to see that happen in our day. I'm just reading some chats here. Uh, first is saying, um, by the time Christ come, we'd all be too far gone to know the difference. Well, I just, I think we just need us like, we're going to talk about it towards the latter half of the Bible study with the parable of the ten virgins. That's, that's a really key one of how do you, how do you endure to the end? What does that practically mean for our lives? How do you raise your kids, your grandkids, to walk with God and not be afraid? Because again, God, Jesus is comforting me, saying, all this crazy stuff's going to happen, but see that you're not alarmed. That's verse 6. Don't let it ruin your day. Don't let it consume you with fear and doubt. All right, verse 15 of Matthew 24. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea, Judea flee to the mountains. What is he talking about? Pro, the desolation, uh, the abomination of desolation. He's talking about the Antichrist. So in the book of Daniel, he prophesies there's time, times, and half a time. That's three and a half years in, in Hebrew um, uh, tradition. Three and a half years of this world leader coming on the stage. There's also the, the Revelation talks about the, the great prophet. Um, so all of a sudden, all these people are um, being led away. And it, it's, a, it's a global government. It's a global economy. That, that's what you're talking about. The abomination of desolation is the Antichrist, is, is, according to Daniel's prophecy, is going to stand in the temple and claim that he's God, worship me. And if you don't, you, you're done. We're just going to behead you. <laughs> We're going to execute you. You're done. Um, so that's what he's talking about. So a couple key things to think about. So Daniel's prophecy requires that there actually be a temple. If you go to Jerusalem, there is no temple. It was destroyed. <laughs> it was destroyed, and on top of it is now the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. So in order for that prophecy to even happen, they don't have a temple rebuilt. So that's one key thing that you should be paying attention to. Also, we haven't currently reached every nation on the planet, every, tri every tribe, every tongue with the good news of Jesus. It's underway. These missions leaders are working hard, but it's, it's, it's a hard process, okay? So uh, where are we at? Verse 17, let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. This is when, you know, stuff is really hitting the fan. We're not, we're not in that season, okay? Because if you go back and read through Je Re Revelation, all the uh, bull judgments, all the, um, the, the, the trumpets, that's, that stuff's crazy. We're talking like millions and billions of people dying. It's going to be like, I think one prophecy in Revelation is one-fourth of the planet dies from famine and disease. That, that, in our world, that's two billion people. That's, that's insane. So we're not there yet. Okay, we're Matthew 24. We are on verse 17. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, 
pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For when there, for then there will be a great tribulation. So not just, you know, persecution, not just uh, some of the stuff we see now where people are being put in prison, some people are being killed. Sometimes it's just verbal per- persecution. I've experienced that. I'm sure many of you have too. Great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. Okay? You'll know it if you're in the end times. <laughs> You'll know it. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. For the sake of the elect, those days, the, 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 the followers of Christ, for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Okay? So, uh, sorry, I was just thinking for a second. So, so G- these are all Jesus' words to his own disciples. Okay? You can take them to heart. So this is these verses and many others where Jesus said, in this world, you will experience tribulation. Uh, a lot of people like to say, pre-tribulation, let me, let me check my poll and see what people are saying. Pre-tribulation rapture, post-trib, 25%, 25%, no idea. <laughs> that's, that's cool. So personally, I believe in post-tribulation rapture. I hope I'm wrong. I really, really, really do. Um, so there are some scriptures that talk about that, you know, the twinkling in the sky, it will meet Christ in the twinkling of the sky. That's what Paul wrote. Um, here, let's keep reading, and we'll talk some more about that. Again, that's not little big things official stance. That's Luke's personal stance after studying the scriptures and looking into all this stuff. All right, so we're in verse 23. Then if, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders. So there's going to be stuff behind, there, there, there's going to be, um, you know, demonic signs and wonders. So as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect, the followers of Christ. Verse 25, see, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So you will know it. <laughs> if, if you live to see it, or your kids or grandkids or great-grandkids or wh- wh- however many generations are left, they'll know it. Everyone on the planet will know that Christ has returned. It's not going to be a baby in a manger where very few people know what's going on. It's going to be a worldwide event. Uh, John describes the, uh, the, the heavens opening up. Like, you will know. You'll, you'll hear the trumpet sound. Christ is coming to rule and reign forever. God, say hi to Dennis in the chat. Yeah, Jesus is above all names. We can put our hope in him, man. He's going to... Every I love to say that every wrong thing you see in your world today... Jesus is going to come back and make it right. Put your hope in him. Put your hope on the cross. Put your hope in his word. Amen? All right. Verse 28. Wherever the corpse is, there, will, there the vultures will gather. So there's, there's some dark passages, especially in Revelation. It talks about rivers of blood. and Like, Jesus came as the suffering servant, the, the first advent. The second one, he's coming as the conquering king. He's on the war horse. And the people who are openly fighting against him, it, the jig is up. You either you fall on the rock, we talked about this last time, and be humble now, or the rock will fall on you and crush you. That, that rock is the chief cornerstone, it's Christ. I'll tumble ourselves now. Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. That's also same story in, in the book of Revelation. That's what John saw in his revelation. Uh, verse 30. Then will appear in, in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. It's called the great and terrible day of the Lord. That's what many of the prophets called it. And why is it great? Because he's coming to save the whole planet. Why is it terrible? Because 
every person who had a, a saw Christ in his glorified state were terrified. They fell down. They, 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 they just lost it. Same thing when they saw an angel. Everyone freaked out because in the Old Testament, one angel killed 170,000 of the bad guys. So there, there, there's, there's, there's an awe and a, a power, and we just need to have a reverential fear to know that not that God's coming to smack us over the head of the club. If you're covered by the blood of Jesus, it's a great day, but it's also intimidating and scary to stand before the living God, the creator of the universe, and see him in all of his glory. Verse 31, And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, And they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So that that that, that's what Paul goes on to say. Like we're going to meet God in the twinkling of an eye. We're going to be transformed, resurrected. Amen. The living and the dead. Verse thirty-two. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see all these things. So all the stuff we just read about, the, the birth pains, the abomination of the desolation, um, the, the, the coming, the, all of it. When you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So in one generation's time, all the stuff's going to happen between um, all the bull judgments, all, all the... Uh, the, the, the last seven years, it's going to be nuts. There's going to be a lot of chaos, a lot of turmoil on the earth. And again, God is cutting it short because he knows that if he doesn't, all humanity is just going to be gone. They're all going to be wiped out for the sake of the elect. Um, Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So there's a, a, a new heaven, a new earth, is what Revelation talks about. Verse 36, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Okay? And we're going to talk about what we do in the meantime. How do we, how do we prepare? Um, quick little note on the verses 29 through 31. I just wrote this little note years ago in my Bible. At the hour of greatest darkness in all of history, when wickedness is on the rise, as in the days of Noah, is what it's going to be like. Rampant wickedness, evil. Um, in the days of Noah, God regretted making man. And so he, he said, I'm just going to start over with Noah's family. In that greatest darkness in all of history, Jesus will shine forth with power and great glory. Long for that day. Long for that day when you're going to see your Savior. Keep your focus on that day and pray for the grace to endure. Whatever that cross that you have to bear, whatever that looks like for you. Right? So only the Father knows um, when this specific day and hour is. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in, giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And I don't know if you remember this part, but it says that Noah entered, but God himself sealed that door by his power. Verse 39, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. For a hundred years, they saw Noah building this boat out in the desert. Out. They, didn't know, they didn't know what he was doing. They're probably making fun of him the whole time. Like, you're, look at crazy Noah out there building his boat. Don't know, what he need, don't know what he needs it for. Don't know why he needs such a big one. But he kept, he was a preacher of righteousness. He it wasn't so much his words that preached. It was his life, his, how he lived his life was drastically different. So they were uh, uh, unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be this coming of the Son of Man. So a lot of people are distracted. They're just not paying attention. 
Verse 40, the two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two men will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on which day your Lord is coming. So that's, you know, when I talk about pre-tribulation rapture type, you know, like the left behind type of series, that's kind of a lot of where that comes from is uh, these verses right there. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have left his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his house to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day that he does not expect him at an hour he does not know. And he will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So God is giving us a, a warning. To don't, don't get lazy. Don't get distracted. Don't let the world snuff out what God is trying to do in and through you. We're in Matthew 25, verse 1. Um, and before we get into Matthew 25, I just want to go over. Um, so I mentioned earlier, like my personal belief is post-tribulation rapture. That, that's what I believe. I hope I'm wrong. Um, why do I believe that? Well, when I look at the, the biblical timeline of <laughs> how every hero of the faith had to suffer quite a bit, the prophets, most of them were stoned or killed. Jesus was crucified. The disciples were all martyred for their faith except for John. John was, uh, they tried to boil him alive. He, didn't, he miraculously survived. He ended up on the Isle of Patmos. Um, so there, there's a correlation between following Christ and taking our cross and suffering. I hope I'm wrong. I really, really do. But there's some, some basic things that we can make sure they're on the same page about. Number one, Jesus is coming back. Number two, he's going to make every wrong thing right. And number three, we're going to live with God forever <laughs> if we've called upon his name. That's the three things that we can all agree on. Amen? Everything else is ancillary to those three. Verse 20, uh, Matthew 25, verse 1. This is the parable of the ten virgins. So, again, Christ is helping us think. This is his teaching on the end times. He's trying to help us think, how do we process this? How, how do we, what do we do in our life now? Chapter 25, verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. They were ready. What is the oil? Oil is often referred to in the Bible as intimacy, as prayer, as our time with the Lord. He's going to, talk, he's going to uh, get, get to it in a minute, but about Jesus saying, I didn't know you. Okay. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. Pretty natural. Just think about the disciples. They, Jesus said, stay up and pray with me three times in his greatest hour of need, and they all, all three times they fell asleep. But at midnight, there was a cry. So in the middle of the night, everyone's dead asleep. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. How many times do you see a kid that walks away from their faith because their faith wasn't really their faith. It was really based on their parents' faith or their grandparents' faith, or their friends' faith, but it really, really wasn't theirs, right? Verse 10, or verse 9, The wise answered, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. Get your oil. Get your time with the Lord. It's not a legalistic thing. It's <laughs> how much more insight and wisdom do we need? When we spend time with the creator of the universe, when we pray, when we get in his word, we get in his presence, and we just adore him, we get our marching orders for the day, 
And we go and we do them. And we have joy, unspeakable joy. We have peace. We don't have to be worried or anxious because we're about the Father's business. Amen? That's what the oil is, intimacy with God, knowing him, being known. Verse 10, And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. There's a feast coming. We're the bridegroom. Jesus is the, or, or, Jesus the bridegroom. We're the bride. The church is the bride. We're getting ready for a big party. It's going to be a lot of fun. But the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Watchful prayer, watching, paying attention to the signs, but not letting them dominate our lives, not letting the news cycle or the social media posts ruin our day. Be about the Father's business. Be attached to the vine, but don't let it control you. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Common theme. Verse 14 of Matthew 25. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one, this is the parable of the talents, by the way. To one, he gave five talents. To another, two. To another, one. To each according to his ability. Then he went away. So God might call it a talent is a, a unit of money. Um, it, was about, it was worth about 20 years of wages for a, a general laborer, okay? So the one guy was invested, <laughs> that's a lot of money for, for one dude, right? More than a lifetime's worth of work, five talents. Each according to his ability. You have a certain measure of ability and gifting and passion that God has given to you. And here's what he wants us to do with it. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. We will have to settle our account one day with God. We've got to get that in our mind and be ready. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more. Do you imagine the, the, the joy that he felt in that moment, knowing that he had done the right thing? He was faithful over the long haul of his life. Over All the sacrifices, all the good choices he made over and over and over. He brought five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Notice how God did not say, or the master did not say, Here, take a break. You've earned it. Go on that vacation. He said, No, I'm going to give you more responsibility. I'm entrusting you more because you've been faithful with this little bit. I'm giving you more. That's God's heart. That's his heart for you and for me. He wants to give us more, but he needs to be able to trust us. Amen? I want to be trustworthy. What about you? Enter into the joy of your master. So there's a, a rejoicing. There's smiles. There's laughter. There's hugging. Verse 22, And he also, uh, he also who had had the, te- the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I've made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, he also had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew that you would be a, you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master said to him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you brought, you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. 
So take the talent from him who from him and give it to him who has the ten talents for to everyone who has will be given or, excuse me I can't read all of a sudden for to everyone who has will more be given and he will have an abundance but from the one who has not even what he has will be taken away we are called to be stewards we all have the same amount of time we get differing amounts of money and relationships, different variances of money and relationships. Those three things are the big ones. What do we do with our time? What do we do with our money? What do we do with our relationships? Are we investing? Are we, are we using it for God's purposes? You know, sometimes I could, I'll be honest with you, like even this morning, just getting ready, I spent some, some good time with the Lord and worship and prayer, and I also spent some time just kind of wasting it. And that time's gone, right? Same thing with money. It's so easy to think like, this will be a fun thing to do. And then you spend time and money doing some kind of activity and you realize, oh, man, that, that, that felt like it was just kind of empty and hollow. Are those relationships where there's maybe wounds or brokenness or maybe that, 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 that relationship's a little too, too much right now. I don't want to talk to that parent. I don't want to talk to that spouse, that sibling, that coworker, that neighbor. You fill in the blank, right? Are we using our time, money, and, and giftings the way that God has called us to? What is he calling you to? I want you to think about that right now. I, want, I know the Holy Spirit's speaking to you and to me. So what is he calling you to? Think about it. Feel free to share it in the comments if you want to, and we can pray about it. Verse 31 of Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What did Jesus say? I'm leaving you, but I'm going to prepare a place that you can't even imagine or think. That's what God's doing for us. That's what he's prepared for us. Verse 35, For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Verse 37, Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger or wel and welcome you? Or when did we see naked and clothe you? And when did we sick, see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these. My brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Notice that that fire was prepared for the devil. It's not for you and me. It's not meant to be for us. God is just pleading with us in this age of grace. He's saying, Come to me, repent, give me your life, and I will give you more than you could ever hope or imagine. Amen. For you, I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Father, I just thank you for my friends that are listening right now. I thank you, God, that you're speaking to them about the people in their lives that need to be clothed, that need to be fed, that need to be comforted or visited. God, we all have people. Maybe it's that friend, family member. Maybe it's that friend that's just hard to deal with, a little tiresome a little needy. God, help us not to 
give up on helping others. Help us not to give up on loving on our kids, our spouse. Let's start there. Help us to think of those people at our church. They just need a, an encouraging word. They need a smile. They need someone to say, hey, let's get some coffee. Let's have lunch. Help us, Lord. Help my brother and sister watching right now to hear your voice and take some action this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, guys, I'll stick around for a little bit if you guys want to ask questions, talk some more. If you missed the Bible study, rewind it to the end, at the beginning. If you just found us for the very first time, you can have a thumbs up, subscribe to get more Bible studies. We have a whole bunch on our, our channel, plus all the shorts videos and other topical videos. Um, I'll, put a, I'll put a link to the playlist in the chat. That way you guys can enjoy all the sweet Bible study action we got. Let me find it here. Do, 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 do. Uh, there we go. I'll put the link in the chat if you missed the Bible study. We've been going through Matthew. It's been a lot of fun, so if you missed one, feel free to go watch that that, that playlist. So let me know. Um, what's your thoughts on, on uh, end time stuff? Do you have questions? Do you have comments, concerns? Obviously, this isn't an end all be all. It was Jesus teaching on it. So it's Matthew 24 and 25. Um, I, I personally love the topic myself. I think it's a lot, eschatology is a lot of fun, end time stuff. So let me know if you guys have any comments, questions, prayer requests. We'll just stick around and have a little. We'll family chat about that. But I think it's interesting when you look at stuff, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of the World Economic Forum. They're this group that <laughs> they literally want to have a uh, worldwide economic system so that <laughs> that's biblical prophecy starting to unfold. Um, as far as a one world government, I don't know how that's going to shape out. I really don't I have, I have theories, I guess, but I don't, I don't really know what that means, what that would actually look like. As far as who the antichrist will be, I don't know. I guess it would be the leader of that one world government, <laughs> whoever that is. I'm not really sure. I think uh, if we were alive to see it, we would know it. I don't think it'll be a... I think it'll be pretty, pretty clear. So I'll stick around for a little bit. If anyone has questions, comments, concerns, let me know. Otherwise, we'll just, uh, we'll just end the stream there. If you see me looking off the side, I'm not, I don't have Tourette's. I'm just looking at the, I have the comments pulled up on a, on a laptop here so I can keep in, keep reading them. Hey, little notes. Amen, sister. Glad to have you. Little notes. Did you did you hear the uh, hear the discussion or able to hear part of it? I'm curious what your thoughts are. I got Nora, Jared, Andre, Dira, first, and Dennis. Are you guys still here, or did you have to go? It's always a little bit of a delay in the chat, so stick around for a little bit. But as far as, um, yeah, as far as end time stuff, I think it's, I think it's interesting. Again, if you missed that comment, some people think, well, that's, that's, I've talked to people that said, well, that's dumb. Why, why are we talking about end times and eschatology? And really it, it influences how you live your life right now. If you don't actually think Jesus is going to come back and judge the living and the dead, 
that's going to really change how you live your life. The decisions you make, what you do with your money, what kind of career path you have. Like it's, it's, either, it's either real or made up, and it, it, it's got to affect our lives. If it's the real deal, then it should influence how we make decisions. Do I think angels are among us? I believe so. I believe, you know, the, the scriptures talk over and over how the angels are messengers of God. They're uh, ministering spirits sent to help us. And I, I really believe that uh, God uses them in, in like, This isn't this isn't a, a biblical text, but I think this author has a pretty good way of explaining stuff like that. His name's Frank Peretti. Um, I I read this book years ago called This Present Darkness, where it talks about the, you know, his his case was it, it's a novel, but his case was when people are offering up prayers to God, then God is dispatching angels to go and respond to those prayers. And we see that throughout the biblical text, you know, with Daniel's prayers. Um, I, I mean, case after case after case of where God sends angels to answer people's prayers. So I, I think that's really part of it. And uh, I, I love it that even though Lucifer became Satan, right? And he took he he said, "I'm I'm gonna, I'm going to fight you, God. I'm going to arm wrestle you for your job." And God's like, "Boink, <laughs> no." And uh, he fell from heaven. He only took one third of the angels with him, so two thirds are still uh, uh, angels on God's side. So that's an interesting little tidbit there. And one angel in Revelation is strong enough to grab Satan and chain him up, <laughs> throw him into the pit. So it's uh, it's crazy how powerful they are. Hi, Andrea. Glad to have you. Is the mark of the beast a spiritual thing? Um, I don't know. I think it. I think it really, really will be some kind of actual physical sign because it's. It's. We talked about it a few weeks ago with the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It's not a oops, I blasphemed the Holy Spirit. No, it's. It's really a deliberate choice. And correct me if I'm wrong. I believe the mark of the beast. If you don't take the mark, then you're basically saying. I can't buy or trade anything, I believe. And then I, th I think there's a passage that talks about where it, you know, it means a death sentence, essentially. But I, I think it's an actual uh, physical thing, maybe a stamp, maybe a, you know, some people talk about microchips, some people talk about whatever, maybe a, ta a tattoo of sorts, some kind of brand or something. But um, I don't really know. I really know what that's going to look like. I would not be shocked if it's some kind of technology-based system, just kind of seeing seeing where our world is going. But um, I'm not sure. I'm not certain on that one. Andrea's saying, "Can you please pray for me?" A little bit upset. Um, I lost my best friend. Yeah, I know. I know that's been hurting you. Um, <laughs> cat person, do I support the slave trade? No. <laughs> no, I do not. That's pretty obvious. Let's pray for Andrea. You guys put the prayer emoji in the chat. I'm going to pray for her. If you have other questions or prayer requests, put them in the comments while we pray. Father, I just thank you for Andrea. God, I just pray that uh, you give peace to her heart. Lord, I know this is difficult. It's hard to trust you. Lord, we, we pray for her friend. We pray for restoration, for healing, for humility. We pray for freedom in Jesus' name. I just thank you, God, that Andrea is persistent to keep asking, seeking, and knocking from you. And uh, we, we believe that in your time, in your way, that, that you'll answer these prayers. God, I just pray for both parties that they would be able to realize, man, I did that. I did some same things wrong. I said some things wrong. I, I need to ask for forgiveness. So I pray that both of them would be humble enough to realize that, and you would just bring restoration in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. All righty. Well, let me know if there's any other questions or comments. I'll stick around for a little bit, and then we'll I'll pray over your weekend. Have a good one. Well, the notes is saying, my mom once told me the coming of Jesus is really about death, as no one knows when he's going to die. Well, um, I would argue 
that uh, and I say, hey, hey, do it all. I see your, I see your comment. We'll pray for you in just a second, brother. Um, well, if you go through the the Bible text and especially Matthew twenty four, Jesus is saying like, hey, there's some pretty clear text that this is this is something different. This is something special. So immediately, this is verse twenty nine of Matthew twenty four. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of heavens, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So that that's a once in uh, all of hu- history kind of event. That that hasn't happened yet. So I I would argue. Um, uh, it hasn't yet. It will. No one knows the day or day or the hour is what Jesus said. Only the Father knows that. Literally, only the Father. He'll tell his son, go. Um, hey, dude is asking for some prayer. Hey, seven. Let's pray for a dude. He's a, he's uh looks like um he's in an MRI had to get an MRI. And looks like he needs some surgery. So, Father, we just pray for our friend, dude. God, we just we don't know the whole story, but we know that you're the divine healer. We speak life over our brother. We pray against fear and anxiety and doubt in Jesus' name. I pray that you would touch his body right now. I don't care if it's cancer. I don't care what it is. Father, you're bigger than all of those sick. Excuse me, all those sicknesses and diseases. We speak healing and life over our brother, and most importantly, courage. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, spend time with God. That's, that's the way you got to do it, man. You got to stay plugged in. It's a daily fight, isn't it? Stay close to God, close to Jesus, rejecting Satan's lies. Satan's always trying to poke at us and get us to believe some kind of, uh, that God's not good, that, he's, that we're, we're, we're hopeless, or, you know, you fill in the blank. You know what your lies are, right? Do I know if the time of Jesus coming uh, is soon? Well, again, there's some key things that have not happened yet before his coming. In uh, Matthew 24, it talks about uh, verse 14, the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout all the, the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So that hasn't happened yet. That's in the process. There's, you know, hundreds of missions organizations that are currently deliberately working on that to reach every tribe, nation, and tongue. So there's some nations have, you know, a couple thousand different tribes, how they're set up in different languages. So that's there's a language barrier. Um, many times there is a cultural barrier. Many times there's, we're talking nations that are openly hostile to the gospel. Like if you say you're a Christian, they're going to jail you kick you out of the country or kill you, those kind of nations. Um, So that hasn't happened yet. That's a big one. Uh, Also, there is no, like, also in Matthew 24, verse 15, uh, Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. That is talking about the Antichrist standing in the temple that hasn't been rebuilt yet in Jerusalem and saying, I'm God, worship me. That hasn't happened yet. So those are some key key signs to pay attention to. Um, I think part of what you're seeing in Israel and Gaza and the whole Middle East area, I think it's it, stuff is definitely happening, like big time. Um, I think I think that it's it's heading towards that direction. It would be interesting to see if if someone came on the stage, brought peace to that region, a world leader, could that be the Antichrist? Possibly. Um, someone kind of coming in to broker a peace deal, and all of a sudden the the Jewish people are rebuilding their temple and <laughs> consecrating it. Like, that would be pretty pretty nuts, but that hasn't happened yet. So, um, Shalom. Peace to you, too. Yeah. Well, what's your question about Gaza? No guarantees I'll answer your question, but I'm, I'm curious what your question is. And Yaakov, I'm curious, are you a, are you a Messianic Jew? I 
met a few Messianic Jews, and uh, a good friend of mine in college was part of a Messianic Jew, Jewish, uh, I don't think they call it a synagogue. It's in the, the Minnesota, Minneapolis area. And so it's pretty interesting how that kind of blends. I don't, uh, Yaakov was saying, I don't believe in Palestine. It was an insult to us Jews uh, to rename it that by the Romans. It means Greek invaders. I'm Jewish, but not Messianic. Uh, I do not believe in Yehoshua. Yehoshua? I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Yehoshua. Hey, well, thanks for, for coming and joining. Um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting. I looked into the, the backstory of the, the Palestinian conflict, and it, yeah, it was a, <laughs> a, a, a jab at the Jewish people, for sure, to call it Palestine. And I think, I think that was re further, I mean, they were eventually conquered by the British, and I think the British, what did the British uh, call it? It was like the mandate of Palestine or something like that. So, yeah, it's crazy, man. It's crazy when people think it's okay to uh, murder babies, women, take hostages, hundreds of hostages that are either still uh, being held as hostages or killed. We don't know. And that that's... Some like the moral equivalent stuff, it, it, it bothers me for sure. Yeah, it's interesting though that in Bible prophecy terms, it talks about Jesus standing on the Mount of Olives and it's splitting, and, that, and then there's like this uh scene where people in, in Jerusalem are escaping through that brand new canyon that just got made through the Mount of Olives. It's be interesting to see what happens there. Oh, wow. Um, hey, Yeshea 7 and 8. It was Emmanuel there. Um, I don't know if, if you're referring to a text that I'm, I'm just not clued in on. Dude is asking, what do you think, what do you think Jesus thinks about the war in, in Palestine? What does Jesus think? Um... <laughs> I, my assumption is he would hate it. War is an ugly, ugly business. It sucks when innocent people die on both, on both ways. To be honest, I don't personally believe all the numbers I hear coming from Gaza. That's my own personal belief. Again, don't come after little big things. That's my Luke personal opinion. And uh, it, it, the, I think there's a lot of lies, a lot of deception, um, yeah, it's it's messed up when it's it's wrong to fight for <laughs> fighting against terrorists. I don't I don't get it. I don't get it. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting take, Yakov, about the Palestinian people. There's I mean, there's a lot of Palestinian people in Jordan. And you're saying you're mentioning uh, Lebanon, and so. Yeah, it's a weird region, like, um, and then all of a sudden the U.S. is getting involved by building a pier in Gaza. I, I don't know what that's supposed to do, and I'm, I'm concerned that's going to end up with American soldiers dead and then us getting more involved. Um, yeah, man, that's a mess. Keep praying for peace in Israel, 100%. Daniel's asking for prayer. Um, yeah, man. Let me know how I can pray. I'd love to. Oh, Isaiah. Okay. Yes, Yeshaya. Yeshaya. Yeah, Yeshaya. <laughs> oh, I'm saying that right. It's cool. I've never. I didn't, I didn't realize that was his name in Hebrew. I like that. Due to saying someone is like Israel is killing. Palestine is also killing both sides are killing it is a sad world we live in. Yeah. Thanks, Yaakov. Yeah, it's it's crazy, man. Jesus, I mean, he predicted it 2000 years ago, don't worry about wars, rumors of wars. And I 
it's hard to tell that to someone like I, I've met Ukrainian refugees. I, there's a few that moved into the apartment building and they haven't really opened up, but you could tell they've been through some really, really insane stuff. Um, another guy, you know, I'm actually in a Bible study with, he said he's lost a lot of close friends and, uh, in the fighting and, uh, it's horrific. War is a horrific thing. I mean, if if it's not our pers- your personal country at war, I don't think we need to be at fear and let it, uh, again, dominate our, our narrative. But at the same time, pray. Keep praying. It's easy to get bored and say like, ah, well, that's the other side of the planet and it's, it doesn't really affect me, but we can still pray 100%. Do I do it every single day? No, but I there's many times where God just kind of reminds me of what's going on on the planet and just stop what I'm doing, say a 30-second prayer. Same thing for my friends and family when God just kind of reminds me of someone who's going through stuff. When those memory, those reminders come, oftentimes I'll just stop. Sometimes send that person a text message, just let them know. You know, like I feel like the Lord wants to remind you of this, and many times that's actually the Holy Spirit speaking through us directly to that person in a confirming way saying, hey, I know what you need. I've, I'm, I'm, I'm using this person to speak life over you. Daniel is, uh, um, he says, I'll close my eyes. But can you please pray now before I go to sleep? I need to be strong and weak at spiritual battle. Yeah. Let's pray for Daniel. Father, we just thank you for our brother. We just thank you that we can gather two or more in your name right now. Thank you, God, that even though we're interacting through YouTube, your presence is here in my room. It's in Daniel's room and all over the planet. We just we just recognize the presence of God. I pray for spiritual protection. I pray for strength. I pray that he would rest in your arms tonight. I pray that as he falls asleep, the Psalms and just a worship song would just be flowing through his heart and his mind, and he would just even confess how he's thankful to you as he falls asleep. I pray you just give him peace and safety in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, brother. God bless you. Amen. I love that little note. She's saying pray Psalm 35 and Psalm 91 every night. Yeah, Psalm 91 such a good prayer. Oh, it's so good. It doesn't get old. Dwelling in the shelter of the Most High. Hey, big. God bless you. Yeah, amen. Good night, brother. See you, Daniel. I like the interactions. You guys are awesome. You know, sometimes on YouTube, <laughs> I never know what I'm going to get. <laughs> sometimes ba- people barely talk, and other time they're just listening, and sometimes it's it's not much engagement, but I like, I like the back and forth. <laughs> no, it's fine, Bank. It's funny. <laughs> That's why I didn't say the whole name. You're good, dude. Don't worry about it. Do I know what red eye is? Um, is that referring to the red heifers? Or what is that? I have no idea. I know um, I was learning in Bible school, or like there's been um, different groups within the Jewish faith have been breeding the pure red heifers for years now getting ready to hopefully reopen their temple because that's you know part of the consecration rules in the law of Moses to sanctify the temple oh you're you're awesome seven thanks for praying for Daniel love you brother or sister sorry I don't know (laughs) um yeah, I think that's, that's, I'm with you on that little notes. I know Yaakov is uh, uh, a follower of the Jewish faith, so he, he'd probably say something different, but yeah. Whenever Christ comes, good things happen, but um, oh, Red Eye is the son of Jesse, and, and okay, so that's King David's Hebrew name. Okay. Your last name is Red Eye. Oh, nice. 
Interesting. So, or... So Red Eye is Jesse's son? Because I thought David was Jesse's son. Am I... Is it... Let's see here. Oh, okay. I think I'm I think I'm I think I'm getting it. Okay, so Red Eye is one of the other brothers of Jesse. That's awesome. That's very interesting. That's a really cool uh lineage. I <laughs> never met somebody in that position. You can say, hey, I'm related to Jesse. <laughs> very cool. Um Big is asking for my opinion. Uh, never been drawn towards religion, but recently felt a strong pull towards the Bible. But I don't know which which one to buy to introduce myself. Could you please recommend? Yeah. Um, so I personally read the e that what I was reading earlier today was the ESV English Standard Version. That's my cup of tea. I grew up reading the New King James. Um, that was my Bible for many, many, many years. I. Um, I know some people say, well, you got to do King James. That's, that's the only way. It's The problems happen, happen with the King. The King James is very poetic. That's why I like the New King James, but also why I like ESV, because there's certain things that just don't translate quite right. Um, King James is a word-for-word -word literal translation from Hebrew and Greek in, into English. Um, the problem with that is there's some discrepancies and some weird stuff in certain verses because Greek and um, Hebrew are very different languages than the English one. You know, they, the Greeks had multiple words for our English word love. So I, I would recommend the ESV. I like it. It's, it's got a good blend of um, the poetic, the literal. I love it. Um, if you want something a little easier to understand, if it's just, you know, you're not a, a big reader, I would check out the New Living Translation, NLT. And big, I would challenge you to go get a Bible and just read through the book of Luke. Start there. Gospel of Luke is uh, it's just a great overview of the story of Jesus, uh, very approachable. Um, I think you'd really like it. I would, I would, I would go there, Ben. Yeah. Yeah, there's just certain things in King James that are just, ah, oh, they just, I, I don't have the specific Bible verses right in front of me, but I've compared them. I did a bunch of homework in, in Bible school when I'm, you know, <laughs> the, the advantage of going to a small Bible school like I did is I met people from all kinds of um, de religious, de uh, Christian denominations. We're all in one little melting pot, all reading the same Bible text and different translations every day and studying it. And there's just you could just see the differences, and so I I, I researched it, looked into it. I was like, yeah, I, I like the SV. That's that's a nice one. So perfect, no, because I don't speak. <laughs> I wish I could speak Greek and and, and Hebrew. <laughs> that would be perfect, but I don't. So. Yeah, big. God will. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge God and he'll direct your steps. Acknowledge the Lord and he'll direct your steps. That's what he's doing right now. He's directing your life. He wants he has good plans for you and he wants to speak to you. So, yeah, I would definitely start with Luke. Read some Psalms, read some Proverbs. Uh, you can go through the other, other Gospels later, but I would start with Luke, yeah. Hey, thanks, Big. I appreciate it, man. Thanks for the sub. If you guys are liking it, hit subs. I, I don't do the live streams every single day. We, uh, To be honest, my wife's about to have a baby, so I, I do them as much as I can. And we got some fun podcasts we recorded, and they're about to hit live. We have some new new videos always coming out and the shorts and all that stuff. I know you guys, a lot of you guys like that. So, um, Is ESV good for Catholics? Sorry for butting in. No, please. I, I don't mind at all. You know, I'm, I didn't grow up Catholic, so I don't, I'm not a, a great authority on that, that subject matter. I know the Catholics have their own Bible um, with some different, different texts and stuff that they include there. Um, I mean, the, the, 
like a, it has all the, the the normal 66 books that you would, you know, in the Old Testament and New Testament. It just doesn't have the Catholic specific books like, uh, golly, I'm, I'm blanking on some of the names, but um, isn't there, who's the guy that tick, got taken up to heaven um, on the chariot, Old Testament? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, the book of Luke, big. That's what I would start in the, the gospel of Luke. So that's just the, the life of Jesus from his, his vantage point. So he, was, he wasn't a direct disciple of Christ. Like Matthew was actually one of the disciples of Christ who walked with him. Matthew goes in all sorts of detail. He was also a tax collector, so he's kind of a type A personality, right? And um, Luke interviewed Peter... Um, I think James and a couple others for he, he interviewed like three or four of the actual apostles to write his account. Luke was actually a a, a physician by trade, and um, he was also um, he was also what do you call it the scribe for a number of Paul's books in the in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul. So. Elijah? Oh, yeah, he was on the chariot. Now, there's a different guy. Uh, I don't know. I'm blanking. It's old. It's before that. <laughs> um, there was two guys taken up on chariots. It was the first one. <laughs> let, me, let me try to see if I can find it real quick. Enoch. Enoch. That's what I'm trying to say. E-N-O-C-H is not in the Catholic Bible. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. The kindness, pride, knowledgeable Christians carry. Uh, yeah, big. If you uh, if you give, give your heart to the Lord and really... And I think a lot of people are searching for answers, especially when the world's just... <laughs> clearly falling apart and going nuts. Um, the truth of God's word always remains. It doesn't doesn't change. And so I think a lot of people are just hungry and searching and wanting truth. Yeah, like, well, uh, Seven was asking about the, the Catholic Bible and is the ESV good for Catholic to read? And I know the Catholic Bible has some extra extra books in there compared to your, you know, ESVs, your NIV, NLT, New King James, King James, all those. Yeah. 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 I would, I would give it, I would, I, I own multiple Bibles personally, so I don't think it's wrong to have more than one seven. I would just go get another one and try it out. Check it. Very cool. I love it. Yeah, Hebrew is such a, a it's like a, like, almost like calligraphy. It's a beautiful language. I wish I could read it. Yeah, Flap was saying Book of Barnabas. He was um, traveling around with Paul. It's very interesting. <laughs> nah, dude. We like people to interact. Do I, do I read Apocrypha? No. I mean, I had some buddies in college that were kind of getting into that stuff, so I, I read one, one, one or two things, but I didn't, I didn't really get into it, I guess. Um, hey, Big, I'd rather you ask the questions than just stay quiet because, you know, it's, it's good to ask questions. The only, as the old saying in school goes, the only dumb question is the one you don't ask, right? So why not ask it? I'm not the end-all be-all. I'm, <laughs> I'm not some Bible scholar over here. <laughs> I've been Christian for, shoot, um, almost, it'd be 23 years in October. And went to Bible school. I've sat under some amazing preachers throughout the years, and I like to take notes and just observe things, read good books. So, yeah.
whatever I can share, I'm, I'm hope, hopefully it helps. Fifty-eight books of apocrypha. Wow, I didn't realize it was that many. I thought it was a smaller bunch, but Ethiopian calligraphy. Very interesting. There's a guy I met through this channel. He's from uh, Ethiopia slash Eritrea, and he now lives in Finland. I wonder if he knows how to do that. Yeah, the the there's the Ethiopian Orthodox church is very very i think they have the oldest church or one of the oldest churches in the world in ethiopia it's pretty cool looks so ethiopian calligraphy you're saying is looks like a picture interesting yeah oh yeah maccabees that's the that's one of the bigger ones i kept forgetting about that one the maccabean revolt yep kind of led up to the whole uh, lighting the menorah that tradition. Yeah. Brit Hadisha. I have heard of it, but no. And I no, I don't speak Hebrew. Sorry. I've I, I I've heard of Hadisha, but I haven't. I, I don't know a lot about it. Oh, okay. Interesting. It, what is the Brit inside of? Is that part of? Is that part of? Uh, um. Well, there's the Talmud, right? Is that the? I'm getting things mixed up because I know there's a specific name for the first five books, like Genesis through Deuteronomy. That's one. One word, and then the Talmud is. Religious teachings of the Jewish faith. I forget. Did Jesus die for your sins? Yes, he did. Torah. Okay. What's the Tanakh in the... I, I can't do the throat thing, but... <laughs> in the Talmud, what, what, what are those? I've heard it mentioned, but I, I don't know. Andrea's asking you, Yaakov, if you do Passover... I've been to a Seder one time, also in Bible school. That was some some classmates did a Messianic Jewish Seder uh, celebration. That was there's there's a lot of really beautiful symbolism in that in that meal and that celebration, and uh, it's very cool, very very cool. I like it. Flab was asking, did Jesus teach you how to pray? Um, I don't know what you're getting at, man. <laughs> yeah, he said, uh, pray in my name. I, I don't know what you mean, man. Sorry. Full Hebrew Bible is Tanakh. Five Moshiach books, Kedavim, Kedavim Nevi'im writings, prophets. Talmud is Midrash. Daft, Gomorrah, Commentary, and Tanakh. Okay, interesting. Never, I've never talked to anybody about all this stuff, so it's 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 interesting to learn. Oh, I've heard of Amharic, yeah. Big, I think that's what my the the guy I know from from Ethiopia now in Finland. That's what he was talking about, yeah. Jesus prayed. Do you know how to pray? <laughs> yes, brother. <laughs> I assume. I, sorry, I don't know if you're a brother or sister, but yeah, I know how to pray. Yeah, Aramaic is pretty cool. I think wasn't Aramaic kind of a blend of um, Hebrew and is it Greek? Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Oh, Flaba, are you asking Yaakov in the comments about that? Is that what you're you're talking about, like the Jewish the Jewish prayers? I don't know a ton about them, but it's interesting when you know, like I, my wife and I like watching the Chosen series. If you guys have seen that, and they're you know 
they do the 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 traditional prayers in the morning and evening and and before meals and all that in in that series so it's 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 interesting I, I like that kind of rhythm to life that's a a beautiful way to do it interesting Yehudi. Hey, Flab, I, I'm not trying to ignore you, man. I'm just, I don't, I don't understand if you're asking me that question or you're asking our friend Yaakov. Uh, if you're asking me, I don't know what exactly you're asking me. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> ask a little more. <laughs> Are you, okay, so Flab, are you talking about the Lord's Prayer? Is that what you're referring to? Yehuda. Oh, that's cool. I don't know what you want, Flabba. <laughs> I don't know if you're trolling me or want to start a discussion. I don't know, man. <laughs> I'm I'm pretty sure he's talking to me, Yaakov. <laughs> I just don't get it. <laughs> I'm trying to trying to figure it out. I'm trying to decipher the I feel like I've answered the question a couple of times, but maybe I'm not answering it the way he wants. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's funny. All right, guys. Let me know if you uh, want to talk about anything else. Oh, I'm speaking to you with the mic. Oh, okay. Um, do I pray like Jesus? Do I do I pray the, the Lord's Prayer every day? No. Um, I'd say often. If that, I don't know if that answers your question. What do you think? Uh, do you believe in the Trinity? I don't. I mean, I can see if you're if you're Jewish, that 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 doesn't make sense. Um, I do. Yeah, I believe in the the Holy Spirit. A lot of people try to explain it like you know, it's like an egg, where you get the the shell, the yolk, the um, white part, <laughs> whatever that is. But that that analogy fall even that analogy falls apart really quickly. Many other Bible scholars have done a much better job of explaining the Trinity than I ever could. But uh, the Son of God, but not God. Okay. Um, is it? Maybe I'm thinking Islam, but do the Jewish people regard uh, Jesus as a prophet or? So if he's the son of God, what does that what does that mean exactly? In the Bible, Jesus showed you how to pray when he went to the mountain. Um John seventeen, yeah, I'll look it up real quick. Where are we in John 17? The high priestly prayer? Um, can, let me know a specific uh, 1 to 20. Sure. Uh, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. So this is right before he goes to the cross. Um. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have, you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence 
with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave to me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept, they have kept your word. Now you know that everything that you have given, now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words you gave me, and they have rec- received them, and I have come to know, or, sorry, I'm struggling here. And they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. This is John 17, if you're just tuning in. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, Judas, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the word, in the world, that they, they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That was John 17, 1 through 20. Let's see, let me catch up on some comments here. Yeah, I I love, uh, makes me think of Proverbs 8, that passage, especially the um, verse 5, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So I love, I love what Solomon wrote in Proverbs 8. Let me find it here. Um, so in Proverbs 8 starting verse 12 I wisdom dwell with prudence and I find knowledge and discretion the fear of the Lord is, is hatred of evil pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate I have counsel and sound wisdom I have insight I have strength By me, kings reign, and rulers decree what is just. By me, princes rule, and nobles all who govern justly. I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently find me. Riches and honor are with me. Enduring wealth and righteousness, my fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield than choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness in the paths of justice, granting an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasuries. Verse 22, the Lord possess me. Um, some translations might have a different word, but there's an option for the Lord fathered me wisdom at the beginning of his work. The first of his acts of old, ages ago I was set up at the first before the beginning of the world. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. Before he had made the earth with its fields, or the first of the dust of the world, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep. When he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman, and, it was da- and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. And now, O sons, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise, and do not neglect it. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who fails to find me injures himself. 
all who hate me love death. I would argue wisdom in that in Proverbs eight. That's that's Jesus. That's talking about him. That would that would be my response. Psalm two, read. Wait. Uh, help me out here. Is that twenty seventh Psalm? What are we doing? <laughs> Interesting. Pray in Jesus' name to Adonai. I like it. Pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Hey, Gage. Glad you found us. Do you understand that God, the Jews are God special? And I'm not being disrespectful by saying God. I'm just, uh, I know you did the transliteration. I just said it quickly. I'm not trying to be I'm just trying to tar- start an argument there, brother. Special people still because of the promise and inheritance. Yeah, hundred percent. I don't think, I don't think the the promise is null and void. I think <laughs> when he said that to Abraham, he meant it. Hey Tracy. Hey, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I've been doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes because I my my wife's about to have a baby, so I've been trying to catch up on a lot of other stuff. I haven't forgotten about you guys. So she's she's due on Wednesday, and I'm trying to work ahead and get a bunch of stuff done that is like you know time sensitive stuff. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, oh, Psalms two verse seven. I'll look it up. I'm curious. I don't remember what that one is. <laughs> I do look Jewish, don't I? I get that a lot. <laughs> I do, I do. I've had many people refer to me as Adrian Brody or Screech from Saved by the Bell. (laughs) Yeah, no, I get asked that if I'm Jewish. I'm not. Mostly German. So, I don't know. I don't know where where that ancestry, maybe there was like Jewish ancestors somewhere in my lineage. I've also been told I look like I'm from Turkey or just somewhere around the Mediterranean ring, really. Uh, Psalm 2 verse 7 says, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Um, I love, it, it's kind of a scary but also good part of this next. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Kiss the Son. Fall on the rock before he falls on you. Submit. Yeah. Thanks, Jared. I appreciate that. Is uh, My first, uh, it'll be my wife's first child, and um, I have two kids from a previous marriage, so be my third. All boys. Men. <laughs> Raising men here. Yeah, thank you, Flab. I appreciate that. Is David begotten? Um, well, hey, sorry, man. I'm not tracking with you. Again, I'm not, I'm not a super apologist here. There's a different psalm. Maybe someone knows it. For David said, the Lord said to my Lord. I'm blanking on where that's at. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of cool stuff in the Davidic psalms for sure. Is David begotten? Are you talking about by God or, I mean, he was born by, you know, his mom, Jesse's wife. One second, I'm going to look up one other thing real quick. Yeah. 
is a reference point to Romans 1, verse 4 in my study Bible. I'm kind of curious on that passage I just read, uh, Psalm 2, verse 7, Romans 1. So it's, uh, Romans 1 starts, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Christ Jesus our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the, all the nations including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his saints, grace to you and peace to our Lord. So this is kind of like his opening greeting in the book of Romans. Yeah. So some, some scriptures say, or some, some transitions when it says uh, Psalm 2-7, some say begotten, some say fathered, there's 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 different words used. I don't know. I don't have it off the top of my head. The actual Hebrew word, what that translates to, that'd be an interesting Bible study. Psalm two seven. What is that actual Hebrew words there? Except for begotten. Yeah, Tracy, please. I love I love the prayers. We'll take them. Hey Renee, glad to have you. Oh, the Lord said to my Lord, that's that's Psalm two. I thought it was different, but maybe I'm maybe I'm getting them all confused in my head. <laughs> sorry, we started on a Matthew Bible study and we're going going on a journey. <laughs> Flab was saying, please read Matthew twenty six, thirty nine. Thank you, Tracy. I really appreciate the prayers, man. Or, sorry, you you're probably a a, a female. <laughs> Sometimes there's males with that name too. Uh, Matthew, we're going to Matthew 26, 39. That's what Flabba is asking about. 26, 39. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed. This is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, for those who don't know. Um fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Amen. Yep. Think about this. So the geography of Gethsemane, it's at the base of the Mount of Olives. It's this little grove. And across the valley, up here in the, in the Temple Mount, he could actually see the soldiers with their torches the, as, as the temple guards come out, the, he could have seen them coming at him. It's dark, right? And the whole time he's praying, that's that's the backstory. They're coming down the hill right at him. He knows that. And we've talked about this in some of our other videos, but think about the courage that it took Jesus to stay there. He's sweating blood. He's so stressed out. And he stayed there and prayed for you and me. All he had to do was walk into the dark woods, disappear into the night. Said, I'm I'm I don't want to do this. He didn't want to. He clearly said that. It says, if it's possible, let this cup, cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So he continued to submit himself to the Father over and over and over. Yep. Well, there's other times that um, he wasn't on his faith. I, I think there's there's power to that. You know, I've, I've had many, 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 many times of actually on my knees, on my face before the Lord, crying out to him, whether it's for breakthrough in my own heart and um, a loved one for healing. I, I think the more we can pray, the better. I love uh, Br Brother Lawrence. He was a monk. <laughs> and he wrote this little booklet, good read, called Practicing the Presence. 
And Brother Lawrence, his job in the, what is it, monastery, was to clean the dishes. And so he would have these phenomenal prayer times and reciting scriptures while he's washing the dishes. And his argument is, it doesn't matter what you're doing, you can be praying 24-7. And we talked about that today in, in the, uh, talking about Matthew 25, the parable of the, the wise virgins. They f- have a full cup of oil. They're constantly filling up on God's presence, being filled and pouring out, right? Constantly. Let me catch up on some comments here. Uh, I'm, I'm getting you confused. Sorry, Yakov. I'm getting myself confused some days. Yeah, imagine that. That's uh, somebody co- put up a uh, little graphic community post on on YouTube here recently, and someone commented that's an actual medical condition where you get so stressed out, your your, your capillaries actually start bleeding, so they come out. Um, the blood actually comes out of your sweat. It's in it. It's only in times of extreme, extreme stress that that happens, but it can happen. Yeah. I think we need all of it. I think there's times where you got to shut down business as usual, get on your knees and cry out to him and focus. Because if you're like me, you got your phone, it's got notifications, you got a billion distractions. So I think there's some to it. It's a humble act of kneeling down, but when you're f- face on the floor, you're not distracted by all that stuff. Assuming you turn your phone off, turn off all the, the, the distractions, and you just focus and let your father speak. Let it be a two-way conversation. I'm not just, you know, blah, 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 blah. Here's what I want, God. Thanks. See you later. <laughs> but taking time to listen, I think, is really powerful. It's hard, but it's powerful. You know? That was a weird sound. Um, nope. Praying in Greek means to to beg. Right, I meant to beg. Adonai. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. So the Greek word is like a a begging. All right. Let's not talk about monks. <laughs> well, with any any religion, any any denomination, there's good ones and bad ones for sure. Interesting. Give me something to think about there, Yaakov. I'll have to look it up. All right, guys. I tell you what. I got to do some other stuff for the rest of the day. Let me pray over your, your weekend. Just uh, uh, pray a blessing over you, right? Father, I just thank you for my friends. Thank you for the great conversations that we've had. Thank you for the time just to study your word, hear from you. God, we thank you that we can seek you. We thank you that you're approachable, that you're not distant and far off in this, uh, this celestial being that is just completely removed from your creation, but you're near to the brokenhearted, you're intimately involved in our lives. Thank you for Psalm 139. You know the number of hairs on our head. You count every tear. You put it in your bottle, Lord. You know us inside and out. Thank you that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you that you have good plans for our lives. Help us to walk in them today. Help us to trust you. Help us to not be afraid. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. I hope you have a great weekend. Hope you enjoyed the live stream. Uh, thumbs up, subscribe if you if you haven't already. All that fun stuff. And uh, yeah, thank you. Good luck. Uh, baby's coming soon, so it may be a last stream for a little bit. But if I can, I'll I'll do another one before then. So uh, when am I coming on again? I'll tell you what. It hopefully sometime next week. That's the best I can do for you right now. Trying to get a bunch of stuff uh, done ahead of time before the baby shows up. So yeah. As soon as I can. (laughs) We'll call it that. (laughs) All right. Thanks, guys. God bless you.